All right, so we did our project on the ramifications of globalization in the United States and the UK. I'm Dylan Aldrich. Ryan Montgomery. And I'm Dylan Gentry. All right, so starting in 1980, both Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were elected Reagan Prime Minister of the UK. Uh, sorry, Reagan, uh, President of the US, Thatcher, Prime Minister of the UK. Both are neoliberal. I guess you need to know what neoliberal means. Uh, neoliberals believe in the advocacy of free market, small government, and little to no government in intervention. These are the equality trends in um, both the US and the UK, and they practically mirror each other. If the table for the UK went back uh, to the 30s and 50s, it would look exactly the same. So Thatcherism and Reaganomics are the exact same thing. They're all about deregulation, reducing government spending, tax cuts mainly for the wealthy, and what's known as trickle-down economics. Now, trickle-down economics is the idea that the wealthiest percentage of any population are job creators, which is something we still hear today, and it just isn't true. So what Reagan and Thatcher both did was start implementing policies that favored big corporations and favored the wealthy. This is why, starting in the 1980s, you see a stagnation of wages for the working class and an outsourcing of production. These are the laws that were passed. Unfortunately, the UK isn't as transparent. You can't go through and look up every law that was passed by their parliament. But in the UK, it came to be known as the Big Bang, which was deregulation within the financial sector. Why is that important? Because the financial sector, the laws governing the financial sector, set the stage for the rules that they can play by. And when I say the financial sector, I'm talking about Wall Street, to put it vaguely, the people that have the majority of the money that invest it in the stock market or otherwise, invest it in smaller companies to grow. Well, when you take away the guidelines of what they're able to do, they can do whatever they want, which is exactly what happened. So, like, the law passed in 1987 uh, said, stated that any, uh, so before 1987, this was an idea of Reagan's, his administration, if a CEO or any executive or board member made over a million dollars, then it could not be deducted as a salary expense. Well, this law changed that. It said that you could pay an executive anything you wanted. So now the people that are in charge of deciding who gets paid what, whenever the time rolls around for them to give like a cost of living increase, well, they can just split it up up amongst themselves. So let's say you have a company that has 100,000 employees. So even if you only give them a dollar on the hour raise, that's several million dollars a year. Well, instead, they just would give it to themselves. And this happened since 1980. People, the lower class, the average day laborer stopped getting any raise to speak of at all. So the CEOs, this is where we start to see them making tens of millions of dollars a year. In 1977, for instance, um, the average day laborer made 30%, uh, well, the average CEO made 30 times average day laborer's wage. Now it's over 250. And I think in the last three years, it's actually gone up to over 320%. So the busting of labor unions, this happened all around the world. Um, many of you might not know that in 1981, the uh, air traffic controllers here in the U.S. went on strike, and Reagan went on television and fired them all. Now, what this did was send a shockwave throughout the labor market, and employers everywhere started not valuing labor unions. They stopped listening to what they wanted and basically just did whatever they wanted because now they had the law on their side to do that. Um, so these strikes 
reduce the amount of union members in both the U.S. and the U.K. In the U.S. now, there are about um, 14 million unionized workers, but there were 18 in 1980, and if you look at how much the population has increased, now it should be closer to 30 million, if not more than that. But because of these union-busting policies, um, this is why people who work like at Walmart, who don't have a union, they're forced to work overtime for free. A lot of the times they're not even allowed to clock as a full-time worker, so that way Walmart and other corporations can avoid giving them benefits or uh, paying them a decent wage at all. So the outsourcing and manufacturing happened again because of these laws. Um, so, like, again, with the formation of NAFTA in the 1990s, it made it a lot easier for companies to move throughout the world. And uh, so if you have a company that trades in stocks, the stockholders are concerned about one thing, and that's profit. Well, the one thing that you can really control with any business is the production cost. Because the raw goods cost, you can't really have any control over. It's, for the most part, set. So whenever a company goes to sell or is looking for new investors, they want to look as profitable as possible. So the best way to do this is to reduce the number of employees or reduce the number of uh, salary wages and as we know today the majority of manufacturing is in places like China and India and that's because it's actually cheaper to have even if it's sourced in the US if you have raw materials that are grown or made in the US it's cheaper to ship them to China have whatever it is assembled and then ship back I think the average t-shirt costs like a dollar a little over a dollar to be made out of cotton that's made in the U.S., it's uh, ends up being like a dollar forty-two to come into the U.S., and that's with a twenty-four cent tariff. So, all these laws that Reagan put in place with the idea of big government being bad, um, the markets will control themselves, and laissez-faire economics. Uh, what ended up happening? was these people on Wall Street who are investing in corporations that are outsourcing. The people that used to work in these manufacturing jobs don't have anywhere to go now. So what happens is from the 80s moving forward, the cost of living keeps increasing. The prices of houses increase, groceries increase, vehicle prices increase. The only thing that's not going up is the amount of money that you're bringing home. So this is where we see a rise in debt financed living or like a credit boom. So people would become accustomed to a certain lifestyle or even if they're not accustomed to it, if they're just trying to make their way in life, but you're only making X amount of dollars and your expenses are Y, well, the only way to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak, is through debt. It's through debt financing. So, people start borrowing money at a more rapid rate. And what happened in the 2000s is people were borrowing more and more money uh, to finance their homes. And... Um, they saw this increase of housing prices that just seemed to be never ending. So you borrow money on your first home and then to buy a second home and then flip that second home and use the equity from that home to buy a third or fourth home and that's what started happening. Well these subprime loans were being sold to investors and the investors would sell them to more investors, they'd package them and repackage them and the idea being no one's going to default on their mortgage but people did. So this leads to venture capitalism, which is essentially the investment into nothing. People move money around to make more money. And it continues because of 
legislation like the Citizens United case, what I call legal corruption or lobbyism, and the only way to fix it is middle out economics. So instead of trickle down, you have to start with a strong middle class to increase the amount of economic productivity because the more disposable income the majority of the people have, which is a middle class, the more money that can be spread to other businesses, and that's the only way to promote growth.